Good evening. I'm Kelda Yoon. The Ford government is doubling down on its decision to close the Ontario Science Centre. Today, officials presented a peer review of the engineering report on the roof that had led to the immediate shutdown of the centre almost three weeks ago. The province says the review confirms the building's structural issues and justifies the choice to shut it down. Queen's Park reporter Lorena Redekop has the details. The peer review is short, just four pages. It backs up the findings of the first engineering report, calling its risk evaluations reasonable. And it says remediating the highest risk roof panels with an eventual replacement of them and the entire roof are appropriate to safely extend the useful lifespan of the building. The reports examined the lighter weight concrete roofing panels, known as rack, outdated in construction today. The building did not close exclusively because of the rack issue. It closed because of a multiplicity of issues. Today, infrastructure officials raised other problems. The heating and cooling system, asbestos, and, say, repairs to one of the buildings across a ravine could be complex. We cannot rehabilitate this asset unless the entire buildings are vacant. There's no spot repair that will be sufficient or safe. Uh, that the minister responsible says it's not worth fixing. Even to bring it up to a standard and code, we're talking about half a billion dollars in the existing facility. But the government has already been planning to move the Science Centre to Ontario Place, part of a controversial development there. Neither report recommended shutting down the Ontario Science Centre. The local Liberal MPP feels the government is trying to justify its decision and gives his take on the peer review. It reaffirms what we already knew, just that the Science Centre uh, has a roof that needs some maintenance and that maintenance can be done and that it's not about to collapse so long as the work gets done. The government also released the business case from eight years ago under the then Liberal government, also looking at the cost to fix the Science Centre, finding it cheaper to move. Already then, repairs were needed. We invest in buildings, you know. And The editor-in-chief of an architecture magazine says historic buildings are worth fixing. It's heartbreaking to see such a great place being taken away uh, from, you know, from, from me and my kid for, you know, for completely spurious reason. A new temporary science centre is at least two years away from opening. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. The number of people in Ontario without a family doctor now sits at 2.5 million. That is up from 1.8 million just Four years ago, the Ontario College of Family Physicians releasing these troubling numbers today, saying action is needed now to ensure the problem doesn't only get worse. Tyler Cheese has more. Data from the Ontario College of Family Physicians is outlining just how dire the family doctor shortage in Ontario has become. 2.5 million people in Ontario do not have a family doctor. That number is absolutely staggering. When patients can't get access to primary care through a family doctor, you can't get the preventative care that you need, like vaccinations against preventable serious illnesses, cancer screening. But what's causing this shortage? We have currently family doctors who are practicing who have decided that they don't want to practice comprehensive family medicine. And secondly, you have less medical students choosing to go into family medicine. He says hours of paperwork, a lack of patient access to team-based care, and compensation that isn't keeping up with inflation are all major deterring factors. Some experts feel that modernization is the key to addressing the problem. If we look at something like electronic medical records and digital spread of information, there is absolutely no reason why in 2024 you cannot have an app on your phone that allows you to connect to your own health data and allows you to send the health data that you want to any physician or healthcare team that's looking after you. He says innovation and digitization will streamline patient experiences and cut down on redundancies that will free up doctors to see more patients. And he's calling on the government to act faster. The Ministry of Health is extremely bogged down in bureaucracy and is unable to make the rapid kind of changes that are necessary uh, in this day and age. In a statement, a spokesperson for the Ministry of Health says the province is launching the largest medical school education system expansion in 15 years, making historic investments into primary care teams and tackling administrative burnout. 
But experts say they fear the problem is only getting worse, with some predicting 5 million people without family care by 2026. Tyler Shees, CBC News, Toronto. A man is fighting for his life in hospital tonight, rushed there in life-threatening condition after the city's most recent example of gun violence. The shooting happened this morning near the corner of Oakdale and Finch. It's the seventh shooting in Toronto in the past six days. And if we dig further into the numbers, we see an even more dramatic spike overall this year. Chris Glover takes a look. A shot-up black SUV near Oakdale and Finch with blown-out tires and bullet holes littered across the driver's side. A man shot and taken to hospital in life-threatening condition as police investigate the latest incident in a string of recent shootings. It's really bad what's happening now. Even sit, sitting in your car yeah. is scary, so yeah, it's not safe yeah. in the city anymore. There have been seven shootings in Toronto in the past six days, including two that were fatal. The recent spike starts on July 6th with the 45th homicide of the year. A man was shot and killed at a Scarborough gas station. Over the next two days, two more shootings. The second was a fatal at a Parkdale apartment building. It was followed by at least one shooting incident every day thereafter. Instead of cutting back, police officer put more on the road for safety, people's safety. Police say the spike is a citywide priority. In the last week, Toronto officers seized nine guns and arrested 15 suspects, including four youth, including arrests in the fatal shooting at the Parkdale apartment from Monday. Two boys, 16 and 17, have been arrested and charged with second degree murder. Their arrests fitting a trend, while the number of adult firearm arrests in Toronto has remained consistent over the past few years. The number of youth firearm arrests year to date has skyrocketed rocketed from around 40 in 2022 to more than 100 already this year, a more than 160 percent increase. The arms are used against the community. So what are the authorities doing about that, you know? Not far from the latest shooting along Finch, resident Wayne Paul says the gun violence spike is concerning, partly coming, he thinks, from a desperate population struggling through difficult economic times. But he says the proliferation of guns needs to be addressed immediately. The problems are coming from various sources, economic, social and stuff, right? But the very first thing that are being used are the tools, right? Like, like, so that is where the, the authorities and the controlling organs have to place some focus. Police say most of the shootings are targeted and isolated. And while the vast majority of the guns, upwards of 90% coming from U.S. states like Ohio and Florida, police say an escalating amount of the violence is coming from gangs recruiting young kids. It's definitely extreme and, and troublesome, but not something that we are shocked by, unfortunately. Marcel Wilson is the founder of the One by One movement, a think tank dedicated to tracking things like gun violence and offering solutions. There's a lot of money out there to tackle the issue, but the problem is the money is going to the wrong places. Government gun buyback programs and enhanced policing are not helping, he says. Instead, community supports to lift, especially children, out of poverty is what's critical. Whenever there's a spike in, in gun violence, we talk about what needs to be done. And so often there is a conversation in the public and among people like you who say that we need to be investing more into communities. And, and yet here we are yet again talking about it once more. What's going to break this cycle? Great question. But what I believe is that we need the decision makers to listen and stop trying to tell the experts, tell the people that are going through it what they need in order to fix this. He points to recent gun violence town halls that have been done with politicians and police, hearing directly from community members affected by gun violence. The city says its Safe TO program that started in 2021 is working to invest in neighborhoods, but advocates say it's time policymakers act faster on what they're hearing to thwart this latest spike and prevent future ones. Chris Glover, CBC News, Toronto. Mayor Olivia Chow weighed in on the recent rise in gun violence in our city. A spokesperson for her office said she's in regular contact with police and community members. A statement from her office said, quote, the mayor believes the best way to prevent violence is to support people and communities. When young people are empowered, learning new skills, finding employment and connecting with their peers, they choose a different path. 
Thousands of Toronto homeowners may be in for a not-so-pleasant surprise after CBC Toronto discovered more than 7,000 electronic transmitters that report how much water you use have stopped working. As one homeowner found out, not only were city staff slow to respond to the issue, but they sent him a massive bill after he had alerted them about it. Angelina King reports. For the last year, Jeff Wong and his family have been washing their hands, brewing coffee, watering plants, using all the water they need but not actually paying for it. And each week their garbage has been picked up. He wasn't being billed for that either, but he had no idea. That's because he pays his utilities through automatic payments, so he didn't realize his bills weren't coming in until he did his taxes in March. So he emailed the city about the issue. Three months later, he finally got a response. I've realized that the water meter is down in the basement. He was told to send in a photo of the meter. Turns out it had stopped transmitting readings a year ago, which meant he wasn't getting a water or garbage bill because they're processed together. Then the city sent him a $1,400 bill to make up for it. It was a bit of a sticker shock to see it. It just makes me wonder how many other sources of, of revenue is, is being lost by the city. How many other households are, are having the same issue. So we asked the city. Turns out Wong is one of 141,000 other residents whose water meter transmitter stopped working. The city says those people are now receiving catch-up bills, estimations based on their previous water use. The city wouldn't say how much money that equates to, but if all those people miss 10 months of water bills like Wong did, then, based on the average water bill, the city, which is dealing with a budget shortfall, is likely having to recoup more than $6 million. And that doesn't account for garbage collection, which some homeowners like Wong were also not billed for. In a statement, the city said... Well, it's common for 1% or 2% of water meters and bills to have issues for several reasons annually. City of Toronto staff observed an increase in failures this past winter. While the water meters themselves are working, it was confirmed the water meter transmission units were failing at a higher rate than usual. This issue is not unique to the City of Toronto. It is occurring in many other jurisdictions as well. You have to have broader concerns. The Canadian Taxpayers like Federation says with thousands of bureaucrats and a $17 billion budget, the last thing politicians should be doing is asking to raise taxes when clearly they can't even manage the most basic services in this case. Wong questions why it was up to him to figure out the problem. I don't think the onus should be on the homeowners to realize that they're not being billed. He paid his $1,400 bill, but... In this current economy and with inflation and everyone struggling, I can totally imagine someone not being... Uh, not having had that in their budget. The city says it's offering fair and flexible treatment to those who are affected, but now there's a new issue. The city says it will have to replace all of the transmitters in all of the homes and businesses in Toronto. There's 470,000 of them. No word yet on when that process will begin, but there is some good news. They're still under an extended warranty. Angelina King, CBC News, Toronto. The city held a press conference today about this, saying it's working to remedy the problem and offering solutions for the impacted residents. We've had a number of, uh, of calls uh, with respect to um, questions that people have had uh, on their billing. Uh, they've seen uh, either some anomalies or they haven't received uh, a bill. And in order to address those concerns, um, we have put in place, uh, and, it, and it's in place right now, a dedicated team, a customer care team, uh, that will be managing this issue solely. Uh, and, and this will uh, be in place for a number of years. Welcome back. Later this month, City Council will vote on whether or not to create designated bus lanes on the southern part of Spadina Avenue. Now, last month, the TTC added more buses on Spadina after streetcar service was temporarily suspended to allow construction work on the tracks. As Greg Ross explains, the buses have only added to what was already a bad congestion problem in that area. And some think dedicated lanes will only make it worse. Since last month, this is a common scene on Spadina, south of Richmond. Buses stuck in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic, sometimes two and three of them lined up together and not moving. 
Know, seeing uh, bus after bus backed up on Spadina in peak hours and, you know, uh, traffic at a standstill is not acceptable. Buses have replaced streetcars on Spadina as the TTC does some much needed maintenance work on the tracks, but it's had a huge impact on transit schedules. What we found early on is that the total trip times were running at around uh, at, at their worst, sort of between 60 and 70 minutes. Normally, those are 20 to 25 minute trips. That could all change later this month when City Council votes on a new motion from Spadina Fort York Councillor Osma Mao. She's proposing giving buses their own lanes. Dedicated priority bus lanes for the duration of the construction, so they are temporary, and that's to ensure that traffic can keep moving and the buses are getting us where we need to go. It will certainly keep buses moving, but many drivers fear it will only extend their commute times. I just think it's going to be hell, and I just feel like there's too much traffic in Toronto already, and they're going to do that. It's going to add worse is going to make it worse for drivers and commuters. It's going to suck for anyone who lives in the area. It's just going to make coming down here that much tougher. The hope is that some drivers may consider using public transit as an alternative. That's congestion that's there because there are automobile drivers trying to get on the Gardener and they're backing up uh, even more so than they used to uh, with the lane reductions on the Gardener. So this is vehicular traffic that's impeding transit, not the other way around. Malik is also proposing that some street parking be removed on Spadina to accommodate the buses. Some business owners along Spadina are concerned that losing street parking could impact their bottom line. It definitely impacts people coming by, quickly hopping out of their cars to come inside the stores. And that's probably much for, for any of these uh, the stores uh, on this street here. Malik says the city would monitor the area to see what kind of impact bus lanes have on traffic and businesses. I'll be watching closely uh, to, to ensure that that the, the promise of what this measure can do to keep traffic moving better is actually yielding those results. If the motion passes, bus lanes could be in place on Spadina early next month. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. For the second summer, the Toronto Maple Leafs are hosting free ball hockey camps across the GTA, giving all kids the chance to get into the game. We stopped by this morning to check it out. So behind us, we're seeing the kids getting warmed up for our second season of House of Hockey, which we do in partnership with Drew House, which is Justin Bieber's clothing company. We partnered with him because we realized to attract the next generation of hockey fans, we needed it to, to be cool and accessible. And the data showed us that cost to participation, as well as accessibility to quality program, was one of the number one barriers for youth in our community, especially when it came to hockey. My friend has been coming here for a really long time, so he told me about this, and then I, I said that I'll give it a try, and then I came, and I loved it instantly. It is really, really, really cool that I get to meet these uh, uh, hockey players. Well, I grew up playing ball hockey, so it was a lot of fun uh, as a kid to get out and be with your friends and, uh, and experience this. Now, th I would say that the balls that they're using uh, in today's ball hockey are a little less hard because back in my day they were frozen and when they hit you, they hurt. <laughs> After the first season, uh, we're, we're growing it uh, uh, exponentially. We're actually doubling the sites and the amount of participants this year. I get to play hockey. I get to, oh, and there's Tim Hortons. Yeah. Um, so I just like having fun here. OK, Colette, how cute was that kid? Got uh -huh. hockey, Tim Hortons, all he needs. Yeah, I think more <laughs> excited or at least as much for the Tim Hortons, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Me too. Well, I think a lot of us are going to love some of the mm -hmm. weather that is coming our way because we've got a jet stream pattern that's going to start to be a little bit beneficial and we're coming towards the weekend, so that's pretty nice as well. Uh, we do know we've had kind of this trough and often the jet stream, you know, it's that stirring, steering current of bringing systems towards us. So uh, when the remnants of what was Hurricane Barrel was coming by, it got picked up here 
here and pushed our way and now pushed on to Atlantic Canada. And what we're going to find as we move towards Friday, still some energy coming our way. And it does give a chance for a few showers uh, as we go into the day tomorrow, a few, but more so a little bit further north from the GTA, but into cottage country. And I'll show you, I'll il illustrate that for you here in just a moment. But then as we go to Saturday, we really kind of get into the clear, a lot of sunshine building in, more zonal into Sunday, still close enough by. And it's really Sunday as we get into the beginning of next week, we'll start to see at least some convective stuff or a little bit of energy coming back our way again. So uh, today's highs really quite impressive. That breeze uh, and with the morning temperatures, it did have a slightly cooler uh, feel to it at times, but really pretty comfortable. And even the humid X values actually were into the low 30s. But we get the clear skies overnight tonight. Should be comfortable sleeping weather. I'd mentioned if you want to, you know, perhaps have your windows open, that might be something to do. But there's some of that energy coming through. Here it is Friday at 5 p.m. A few isolated showers or the odd thunderstorm kind of bubbling up. Um, because it is a Friday evening, just be aware of that because you may have some outdoor barbecue plans, patio, whatever it is you might be thinking, just out for a bike ride uh, because spotty, but there'll be a little bit of wet weather. Most of it does stay, though, to the north of uh, the northern shore of Lake Ontario until maybe the overnight hours where we get a few that even bubble through the Niagara region. And then we go into Saturday and things are really looking good through the day Saturday. Watch out that UV index. It's going to be very high tomorrow as well. A lot of sunshine there. You'll need your sunscreen. Overnight temperatures for tonight. There will be some readings that are kind of dipping down closer to uh, the mid-teens than into the upper teens. And there we go. Our high for Friday, 27. Saturday, 29. By Sunday, we're at 30. And yes, this weekend, we'll find the humidity, those dew points going up a little bit too. So that moisture content of the air. So it does begin to feel a little bit stickier. And that's when we get into that chance for a thunderstorm here or there too, Kelda. All right. Thanks so much, Colette.